By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back in the semi-finals of the Staples Tournament. Yes, we are back at this crazy wacky event where all the staples are banned. So no, no swords to plowshares, no counter magic, well no counter spell at least. Uh, no disenchants, uh, no lightning bolts, just a lot of cool cards. That's what we have. Now, if you're curious about this format, please check the description below for more information. There's also a link in there to the list of banned cards. Um, now, today we have the semis, like I said, and it is between Anders, who's on four color legends. It's really a cool deck. He's taking on Ishan, who also has a very cool deck. He's playing Jacques and Rubinha at the Valley. That's the name of the deck. And uh, it's all about stealing stuff, I think. I think that's one of the themes in Ishan's deck. Uh, but before I jump into the deck techs, I first uh, would like to mention that, as always, you can also choose to first go to the games, check out the deck techs uh, later. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games. So if you click on there, it'll take you straight to the games. And in that same description below, you will also see a link to the Timmy Talks Patreon page, because yes, we have a Patreon program. And if you become a patron of the show, um, you can also join in on these events because I actually organize these online tournaments to thank my um, my patrons, basically, to thank them for supporting the channel. So if you enjoy the show, if you like what I do, if you want to help me continue making this content, please check out patreon.com slash timmytalks for more information. And it already starts for just $1 a month. Okay, and now that all that information is out of the way, we are going to start with the deck decks. I'm gonna start with the deck of Anders, his four color legends deck. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Anders. So it's called four colored legends. And I think, uh, let's just start with the legends, shall we? So first of all, there are four colors in here, mainly of course, black, red, then we have blue, and then there's just a little bit of green in the form of Bartle Ruin X, and of course those two Tranquilities in the sideboard. So just a little, little bit of green. Um, maybe just start with Bartle Ruin X. It is a legendary creature, a 6-5 for three, a green, a red, and a black. So you gotta pay six for a 6-5. And uh, it's got some pretty unique abilities for old school. You don't see a lot of creatures that have those abilities. So Bartle Ruin X cannot be the target of enchant creature spells, meaning you cannot control magic it making it pretty useful. And also attacking does not cause Bartle Ruin X to tap. So just like a Sarah Angel, you can just attack with this, you don't have to tap it. So, I mean, when it comes to legendary creatures, most of the legendary creatures are pretty bad in old school, but this one is pretty decent actually. Um, then when we look at the other two, we've got Gwenlyn de Gorgi. I mean, look at that art, I love it. I love also what this card does. So you pay a blue, a black, a black, a red for this summon legend, it's a three five. So basically if you have the right mana, you've got a three five for four which is pretty good. A Juggernaut is 5-3, this is a 3-5. I think I may rather have a 3-5, to be honest. Really hard to kill. And then the ability is really cool because it's a Disrupting Scepter. If you tap her, she says, target player discards one card from his or her hand at random. Oh, it's even better than a Disrupting Scepter because it's at random with the Scepter your opponent gets to choose. This power may only be used during your turn. So this card is just really, really good. I think the reason that you don't see it that often is of course because of the double black in the casting cost, uh, making it kind of hard with the three colors. Maybe that's a reason. Another reason, I think a bigger reason is the fact that the card is pretty expensive. So not a lot of people have this card. But um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. Then we see Tetsuo Umezawa, which is one blue, one black, one red for a 3-3, three, three, which are again great stats for, uh, for a creature in old school. Three mana for a 3-3, three, three. and then it has an ability as well. So I can tap a red, a black, a black, and a, a blue, and tap it. Then it says destroy target tapped creature or target blocking creature. So again, this card is kind of like a royal assassin, but in a way a little bit better because it also can kill a blocking creature. It's of course worse because you need all that mana to pump into it, but if you kind of ignore that and purely look at the ability, then it's better. Also, Tetsuo may not be the target of an enchant creature spell. So also, you cannot control magic this card. I mean, I really lo love the fact that these, these legendary creatures each kind of have their own personality and have kind of these, these extra added little text lines that make them interesting. Um, I think personally they should have done this with way more uh, legendary creatures. There's so many legendary creatures like Casimir the Lone Wolf that are just vanilla creatures. Just give them some kind of wacky ability that, like, like these creatures. That would have been so cool. 
Um, anyway, getting a little bit off the track here. So these are the three legends. Then if we look at the deck, what he wants to do, um, there's a little bit of a, of a life gain, life take theme in this deck, right? We've got Greeds, we also have Ashes to Ashes, we have we have the Kumbaj Witches. And what all these cards have in common is that they actually also hurt you. So you get something really good in return, right? Ashes to Ashes removes two creatures from the game, but it also deals five damage to you, which is pretty serious. He's playing with three of those. Usually you only see one of these in decks, but in his deck there are three, so that's huge. Then he also plays with Greed, and Greed is an enchantment for one black and pay two life. You get to draw a card. So you can uh, use life to draw extra cards, which is really good. But again, it's life, it's costing life. Kumach Witches is like a uh, protocol sorcerer. You can tap it, deal one damage to any target, but then your opponent gets to deal one damage back to any target as well. So that means you're also hurting yourself in a lot of cases. Now, uh, he's put some life gain in there because he's playing with these cards. And I think that's very sensible of you, uh, Anders. He's playing with a full playset of Drain Lives, which is interesting, right? Because he's playing four colors, but look at the duels, look at his mana base. He actually, most of his mana, except for the Volcanic Islands, create black mana. So he's playing with a lot of black. Black is really his main color. So he can play with four uh, Drain Lives in this deck. He's also playing with two Fountain of Youths. Now Fountain of Youth is a card that I think is a little bit underestimated. It's zero to cast a card from the dark, an artifact, two and tap, gain one life. Now this sounds really bad, but I've actually used this in my sideboard against aggressive ATOG decks, because what they used to do is they would play a vice turn one, pass turn to me, and I play a blue control deck. So it's really tough for me to deal with it. So I would go island, uh, then play out my fountain of youth. And a good thing about that was that um, it, it meant one damage less because it was zero to cast anyway, so I could just drop it out of my hand. And later in the game, I could slowly gain some life and kind of get back. And if there's one thing that direct damage decks don't like, it is life gain, even if it's just one life return, you know. So it's it's funny how Fountain of Youth kind of found its way in my sideboard and it, it actually worked pretty well against a few opponents. Um, but anyway, in this deck, I, it's interesting to see because basically what it does is it allows you to use greed more often, right? It makes greed better. Um, still, it's not, don't get me wrong, I don't think it's a super good card, but it's interesting. I think another line that he could have chosen, although, I'm, oh, I need to check the list again. Is Spirit Link allowed in this format? You know what? I'm going to check it for you and I'm going to show it under here. Because if it is allowed, of course, you could also consider using a Spirit Link in a deck like this. But I'm assuming it's not allowed. But anyway, like I said, I'll put a little comment here on the bottom to let you know if it is allowed or not. And again, if you're interested in this format, you can find a list of all the banned cards in the description below. There's a link there and you can check it out. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. And um, I've said this before in other videos about the Staples tournament. The list is also like evolving, right? It changes over time. It's not um, stuck, you know. Like, how do you say that? It's a process, I guess. It's not like a like a list that's that's set in stone. You know what I mean? Anyway, um, this is the deck of Anders. I am I'm really liking it. I'm really liking it. I think it's pretty cool. I think it's, I also like the immolation together with the Sorcerer's Queen. By the way, that's a very nice forgotten combo. Okay, <laughs> maybe I'm gonna steal that from you, Anders, and put it in Forgotten Combos if I haven't done so already. But a really, really cool and interesting list. It, 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 I have to say, when I first saw the deck photo, I was like, okay, it's, it's a little bit messy, what's his strategy? But now when I'm looking at it and discussing it, I'm like, okay, it makes sense. There are connections that he's making. It's actually a pretty good deck. Uh, we also have a word of command, by the way. Now, I'm not gonna talk about that card, but if you wanna know what it does, please go to the Gatherer and read it over there. It's a super interesting card. And also, if you have rules questions about it, first read the rules section of the Gatherer because there's a lot of useful information there. Anyway, this is the deck of Anders. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Jacques and Rubinha at the Valley by Ishan. And here we see the deck of Ishan. So Jacques and Rubinha at the Valley. And this is really a steel deck. So I'm first going to kind of focus on that strategy. There are a few more strategies in here. It's not just stealing creatures, but I feel that that's a big part of the deck. So um, at the heart of that strategy is Rubinha Soul Singer. Uh, that's a 2-3 creature from Legends, a legendary creature for 2, a green, a white, and a blue. It's actually a creature fairy. And uh, it reads, you may choose not to untap Rubinha Soul Singer during your untap step. And you can tap her and then gain control of target creature for as long as you control Rubinha and Rubinha remains tapped. So you can just steal a creature of your opponent. It's pretty clear. Uh, the nice thing is he's also playing with Diamond Valley and Diamond Valley is a land from Arabian Nights. You can tap the Diamond Valley to sack target creature 
and gain life equal to the toughness. Now, if you, of course, steal the creature of your opponent, you can then sack it to the Diamond Valley. Next turn, untap your Rubinia again and do it all over again. Kind of put all your opponent's creatures through the meat grinder and gaining life um, in that process as well. So it's pretty good, that combination of Rubinia, Soul Singer, Diamond Valley. And then he's also playing with Disharmony. And Disharmony is um, a card from Legends. We're actually seeing a lot of Disharmonies in this Stapeless Tournament. It's one red and two for an instant. And it reads... Target attacking creature comes under your control untapped. Return to former controller at the end of turn. This creature is no longer considered to have attacked. Play before the defense is chosen. So the cool thing about this harmony is you can steal a creature of your opponent when he attacks with it and then block a creature of your opponent and after that also a second to the Diamond Valley. So you can just get a lot of value out of a creature with this harmony. So this is really a big part of the strategy. Then another part of the strategy is kind of revolves around Jacques Levert. So Jacques Levert is uh, a legendary creature, Human Warrior, and it reads, green creatures you control get plus O plus two. So this goes together quite well with some of the creatures in this deck, especially with um, the If Biff Afrit. So If Biff Afrit is a three, three flying creature. So if you have Jacques Levert, it becomes a three, five flying creature. And it is basically a hurricane on the stick. You can pay a green and then you can deal one damage to each player and also each creature with flying. Now, the interesting thing is anybody can activate this ability. So also your opponent. So if your opponent has green mana, they can also use this ability to, for example, kill the If Biff free. But then, of course, you do need enough green. And if you have the Jacques Levert on the board, your If Biff is now a 3-5 instead of a 3-3. So that really adds up. Um, I think those are kind of the main, the main strategies. I love the fact that he's playing a Lurker, by the way. I think it's such a cool card. You, you never see that card. So Lurker is a 2-3 creature beast. That reads, Lurker can be the target of spells unless it attacked or blocked this turn. So it's really hard to destroy uh, Lurker. And Lurker, of course, a 2-3, but when you have Jacques Levert, it becomes a 2-5. So it's a pretty good blocker as well. It's just really nice to see Lurker. I really li like that art. Um, there are just a lot of other really cool cards in here, but I think by discussing the, the stealing of the creatures and the Jacques Levert uh, boosting of creatures, I think we kind of discussed the main uh, uh, strategies of the deck here. What I also kind of like maybe as, as a little uh, added information here is, is the uh, um, combination Pyrotechnics and If Biff Afrit, because Pyrotechnics, of course, a card from Legends, uh, one red and four for sorcery that says deal four damage to um, four different targets any way you choose, right? So, well, you don't have to do it to four different targets. I'm explaining the card pretty bad, but what it does, let me just start over again. You can cast it, sorcery speed, you can deal four damage, and you can divide that damage any way you choose. So you can say, I'm going to do one damage to that creature, two damage to another creature, and one damage to your face, for example. So you can divide it any way you choose. Now that works together really well with the If Biff Afrit, because If Biff Afrit deals one damage to each creature with flying. So if you kind of make puzzle that right, your, your pyrotechnics can be super effective when you have If Biff on the board as well. That's what I'm basically trying to say. Anyway, this is the deck of Ishan. Um, we looked at the deck of his opponent, and that means we are ready to go to the semifinals of the Staples Tournament. Enjoy! Game number one of the semifinals of the Staples Tournament has begun. Ishan starts here with a Taiga. He is uh, playing a four, even five color deck with Rubinia Soulsinger. And he is taking on Anders, and Anders also plays some really cool legends. His deck is called Four Colored Legends. He's starting with a Bayou. Ishan, you're playing a second Taiga. And I think both players kind of have slow starts with their decks. Although I know that Ishan's also playing Whirling Dervish. So that's a bit of a quicker creature you can cast at turn two. But we're not seeing it here passing a turn to Anders. Who has two Bayous. But that's about it. And it looks like, is he passing or not? Yep, passing a turn back here to Ishan. And... Um, Let's see what Ishan can do. Finding another land. There's a Badlands. Are we going to see some action? Or just a pass for now? Again, both players playing quite uh, slow decks, I think. Really need some time to set up. Oh, there's a Word of Command. Oh, this is cool. A <laughs> Word of Command. Oh, man. That is funny. It means he now gets to see Ishan's hand and pick a card from it, play that out. But of course, Ishan can respond with uh, on an instant speed, so he can respond on an instant as normal. So if he has something to play out, it looks like he doesn't, so he's going to show his hand. 
And there's really not anything here for Anders to play out at this stage. So we see Jacques Lever, we see If Biff Afrit, we see two Pyrotechnics and two lands, a Diamond Valley and a City of Brass. So really nothing for, um, for Anders to do anything with. At least he's got some information. So he now knows the cards in hand. Unfortunately for him, not for example, uh, a lightning bolt that he can uh, play and point to Ishan. That would, would have been really nice. Maybe he was hoping for that, seeing the red mana. Or maybe that he could play a drain life for zero, something like that. Anyway, he's playing an uh, underground C, passing the turn here back to Ishan. So we're going to start turn number four. There's that City of Brass we saw earlier. And are we now going to see the If Biff Afrit? He's going to take a damage, going to drop to 19. There we go, If Biff Afrit, so the 3-3 three, three Flyer, and you can pay a green to deal one damage to each creature with flying and each player. And remember, every player can activate that ability, so Anders can also now kill the If Biff by paying three. And he does that very quickly, and I think that's a good decision. You don't wanna wanna wait, because probably if he plays with If Biff, he's got a plan with it. So three damage to everybody here. So that means Ishan is uh, gonna drop to 16. And Anders is also going to drop to 16 because he also took a damage from his City of Brass. So both players on 16 at the moment. Passing your turn here back to Ishan. And I think we're now really going to see the match kind of getting started. Players have enough mana now to start casting their wacky stuff. There's the Diamond Valley taking another damage. And he should be on 15 actually. He's playing Jacques Levert. Yeah, this is the thing. I mean, both players are keeping track of each other's life totals, but that can be super confusing. Um, <laughs> it's usually just better to to keep track of the life total of your opponent's dice then if you want to do it that way. Uh, but this is a bit confusing because I think the life totals on Ishan's side are not correct. Anyway, here we see Anders casting a Phantom Monster, 3-3 three, three Phantom Monster. So Ishan is on 15 and Anders is on 16, just to, uh, to clarify. And I think they're now talking about uh, Jacques Levert. So remember, it also gives itself uh, plus O plus 2. Or actually, does it? Or does it? Yeah, it does. So it's actually a 3-4. That's an important note. So you cannot bolt it away, although uh, both players here, of course, not playing with Lightning Bolt because we're playing the Staples Tournament. Ooh, look at this, Ishan tapping out. Gonna drop to 14. Oh, there's the Pyrotechnics. I'm probably also gonna deal a damage here to Anders. Anders gonna drop to 15. And uh, yeah, so now both scores are correct again. So Anders is on 15, Ishan is on 14, and he's gonna swing in for two. So Anders dropping here to 12. Well, for three, actually, it's a 3-2. So not for two. So yeah, some action here. Both players doing stuff. I think this Pyrotechnics was quite good. What I really like about this card is that you can kill the Phantom Monster and deal that extra point of damage to Anders. It's, it's such a good card, the way you can divide all that damage. You, also get some, you always get some extra value out of the Pyrotechnics. So there's another Phantom Monster. I believe he plays with two in total. So this is the second one hitting the board. 3-3 three, three Flyer for four mana, one blue and three. With really nice flavor text by Alan Edgar Poe, I believe. A poem. Ishan now uh, dropping the Savannah. So still has his 3-4. Jacques Levert there on the board. He could attack with that, of course. First going to cast something, it seems. Oh, another Pyrotechnics. Pyro doing work here. Anders dropping to 11. Another attack on a drop to 8. I mean, Anders is kind of going towards the danger zone. And Ishan just really kind of keeping the board clear with the pyrotechnics and just, you know, keeps chipping in with the Jacques Lever. Jacques Lever now has dealt 6 damage on its own. I mean, it's being pretty effective. And it's hard to get rid of. Okay, there's a Black Knight. More creatures coming, it seems. There's a Greed, though. Oh, and that Greed is not great because he's too low to really use the Greed. 
Two cards in hand, it seems, for Anders. So Ishan here untapping, probably going to attack again with Jacques Levert. Remember, it is a 3-4 because it also pumps itself. Let's see what he can do. There's a Tropical Island. Has all the mana he needs. Two cards in hand, I believe, for both players. Maybe Ishan is worried about some kind of pump spell that Anders could have, instant speed, to put on the Black Knight to kill the Jacques Levera, but I don't think he has to be worried about that. There's the attack. Yeah, there's the chump. And I think it's really easy for Anders here to chump because you know that by blocking it, you're basically also giving yourself a card, right? Because you're preventing three points of damage. Drawing a card is also three damage with that City of Brass in combination with the Greed. If he wants to do that, of course, on the end step of uh, Ishan. So before blocks, I guess stuff is happening. Or else the Black Knight would be dead, right? Because the Black Knight is a 2-2. Oh, but he has protection from white, of course. Yeah, and Jack Lever is also white. <laughs> it took a moment for me to realize this. Wow, are we going to see a Desert Twister on the Greed? Okay. I'm not sure if I would have done that, to be honest, because Anders is so low. I would have been tempted to maybe play the Desert Twister before I attacked on the, uh, on the Black Knight. Then deal three, put him on five. It's easy, of course, to... To say that from my position. Then again, I mean, making sure he cannot draw cards. But look at this, Tetsuo Umazawa. So that's a 3-3 three, three creature, and you can pay... Oh, what was it again? A red, a blue, and two black, and tap it to destroy target attacking or blocking creature. So it's kind of like a royal, but a little bit better, but more costly. But Anders has the lands, and he's kind of stabilizing here, by the way. So he's on 8, but he's stabilizing, and uh, Ishan is on 14. There we see Ishan tapping 5. Looking at his graveyard. What is he going to do? Oh, there's Rubinia Soul Singer. This is interesting, right? Because I think if he... Ah, does Tetsuo also work on a tapped creature? Can't remember, or is it just attacked or blocking? Because then if he would use Rubinia in response, Anders can kill Rubinia. But if it's only on a tapped or attacking creature, then he cannot do that, of course. So we'll just have to wait and see. It looks like Anders' screen is frozen. Some technical difficulties. Nope, he's still there, though. We see that hand, but it's very glitchy. Okay, so it's still very glitchy, but I guess we just have to wait. It does get better later in the, the recording. I just checked. And I also looked at Tetsuo's uh, rules again. So Tetsuo can also destroy a tapped creature. So I just checked it. So it can destroy the uh, Rubinia as well. Here we see an attack, by the way, by Anders with the 2-2 Black Knight. Remember, it's got pro-white. Rubinia also being white. So these Black Knights are really good. He's also playing a second one, by the way. So, I mean, Black Knights could be the MVP of this match. So, Ishan is now on 12, and Anders is on 8. So, it was really looking, uh, looking very, very good for, for Ishan until that first Black Knight came to the party. And the Black Knight being quite powerful with those legendary creatures that are partly white. And here we see Ishan drawing his card for turn. Or not, maybe he's kind of waiting for Anders here to fix the connection. Yeah, internet connection is always a returning hassle. Even in the 21st century, in 2024, it's still really, really difficult. I have some issues with it as well from time to time. And it doesn't seem to matter like what operator you have, you know, if you switch companies, it doesn't really help. At least that's my experience. Anyway, let's see what Ishan can do. We're tapping two trops, two tropical islands, tapping some more dual lands here. What is he going to do? Okay, there's an if biff a free, so there's the 3 3 flying creature again. 
And the, the nice thing here is, yes, Anders can choose to destroy the Ifbif. You know, he can pay three green, green mana. He's got that mana. But then he's also dealing three damage to himself. So that may not be the best decision. Maybe that's what Ishan wants. On the other hand, I mean, Ishan is also getting quite low. And there are also, or, or those two Black Knights on the board that are basically unblockable. Well, they can be blocked now by the, um, by the Ifbif for free because that's a green creature, of course. So this is going to be an interesting scenario, kind of situation to see what Anders is going to do. Is he going to use the forests here to blow up the if-biff board? Okay, and we're back. So I kind of uh, fast forwarded a little bit because there were so many glitches. Anders fixed his connection and now he's attacking with the two Black Knights. Which is quite interesting. Remember, the Black Knights have first strike. So I think this is a pretty good decision by Anders. Because if Ishan blocks, Anders can pump one green in it, and then the if if still dies at first strike damage. So now we see Ishan and Anders, I believe, both on eight. Anders taking a damage from his City of Brass, gonna tap out. Oh, there's a drain life! Could this be the decider, this drain life? It's not big enough, is it? So drain life for five, I believe. So then he would go back up to 12, and Ishan would go to three. Wow, this is such an interesting match. Yeah, exactly, Ishan. I, I believe Ishan was the one on eight. This is the thing when you're keeping two dice for the life totals. It's just it's confusing, man. I think if you do it that way, maybe you should label it or say, okay, this is really my dice, my color. It's just really confusing. Um, anyway, Anders is on 13, it seems. Ishan on three. So it's looking really bad for Ishan. Then again, he can now use his Rubinia Soul Singer to steal the Tetsumo because uh, and Anders uh, tapped out. So Anders on 12, Ishan on 3. He's going to pass the turn. I think on end step, he could have used the Soul Singer if he wanted to. I mean, he can still use it now, I guess. But he could have done... It's, it's easy for me from this position, of course. He could have done end step, Soul Singer, steal the Tetsuo. And then sack it to the Diamond Valley, then untap and steal something else. Although he cannot steal the Black Knights, of course. Anyway, stealing the Tetsuo here. And that means he can attack here for six. So he could put Ishan on six. Does he then have enough green to finish it? He's going to attack here for six. Okay, so he's going to... Put Anders on six. He's on three. Does he have enough green to make it a, a tie, perhaps? Oh, look at this. Gonna sack the Soul Singer. Interesting. He does this, of course, for the life gain. I think he's preparing a huge if biff move. He's gonna gain five more life. Remember, because of the Jacques Lever, so he's on eight. He's shot on six. Does he have six green? I think he does. Three, four, five, six. Oh, he's actually gonna win it still. Oh, 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 what an ending. What an ending. And this is really good magic by both players, but also especially by Ishan here winning game one. And I thought I thought he was gonna lose after a drain life. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be really tough. But he finds his way out of it, wiggles his way through, defeating Anders here. But remember, this is just game one. So both players are going to dive into their sideboards and we will catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So it's one game up for Ishan, meaning Anders is on the play. Ooh, look at that, Willow the Wisp, classic opening. Underground Sea into Willow, zero, one flyer, one black to regenerate. And let's see what Ishan can do. There's a tropical island and a pass turn. Ooh, taking the damage here from his City of Brass, casting a Black Knight. So it's 19 here for Anders, but of course he can start attacking next turn. Has a pretty quick start compared to uh, that first game. Ooh, there's a Life Force from the sideboard. So it's an enchantment. You can pay two green to counter target Black uh, spell. So pretty good, but of course you do need to, to have two green open. He doesn't have that right now, just taking damage. Going to drop here to 18. 
Yeah, I still find it highly confusing. These, these both, you know, having those two dice sets of dices. Because you also see, for example, Ishania forgot to take the to add the damage from City of Brass. So according to him, Anders is still on twenty, while he's actually on nineteen. Those little differences can get really confusing later in the game. Anyway, Ishan now dropping to 16 after that second attack by that Black Knight. And we know Ishan's deck is slow, and he is struggling with those uh, Black Knights. They're really good in this matchup. There's the Badlands. He's a little bit in the tank here. Of course, he has to think, if I tap out to play something, it means I cannot use my enchantment to counter Black Spells. So these are decisions that you have to make. Just passing the turn here back to Anders. There's another duel of Volcanic Island. Gonna tap four here, so it's gonna take another damage, and it seems nope, it's just gonna attack for two first. So Ishan dropping to 14. I mean, the Black Knight's doing work. Sometimes magic can be really simple. There's a Phantom Monster. Another damage for Anders, gonna drop to 18. Passing the turn back here to Ishan. So that means next turn he can deal five. I mean, Ishan really has to uh, get into action here or else this uh, second game could be over quite soon. There's a City of Brass being played out by Ishan. I mean, if he has, for example, Rubinia Soul Singer, he could play it out, steal the Phantom Monster, and then uh, block the Black Knight with it. Of course, this is a slow process, but still. It's going to drop to 13 here. Oh, there's a uh, Pyrotechnics. Yeah, and he's going to kill the Black Knight. That makes sense. He knows that the Black Knight is such a big problem for him. And he probably has another answer for the Phantom Monster later. And now, of course, he can also kill and the Willow and deal one point of damage here to Under. So he's going to drop to 17. Ishan on 13. Untapping upkeep draw here. There's the attack for three. Look at that. It's going down, 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 dropping to 10. So his life is halved. He's going to tap 4 here. What is Anders going to play out? Another point of damage? Nope, changing his mind though. Untapping again. So he's still on 17. What to do? What to do? Okay, tapping 4. Ooh, there's a Greed. That's pretty good, actually. And of course, you want to play out that Greed now because now Ishan doesn't have to two green to counter it with his enchantment. So Anders on 16, Ishan on 10. I think the first point of business for Ishan is to take care of this Phantom Monster. And I mean, that first game was so close. So is this second game going to be a thriller as well? There's a Savannah being played out. Lots of lands here for uh, Ishan to work with. Tapping four. What are we going to see for four? Are we going to see an if biff perhaps? Could use an if biff, of course, to block the phantom to trade. It looks like he's in the tank, though. Not quite sure. Okay, it is. It isn't an if biff, but he is he is playing it out. It is a Jacques Lever. So a three two gives all your green creatures plus O plus two, including itself. So it's a three four. I think if you're honest, you're just gonna attack, right? Maybe first draw a card with uh, greed. Yeah, there's the attack first. Gonna put Ishan on seven. Tapping a black. Okay, there's a Willow. That's a great blocker here. That can block Jacques Lever for days. Are we gonna see a counter spell of he can counter it now? With the green enchantment. Oh, is he gonna do it? I haven't seen that happen in a long time. This is really old school for me. He's going to draw an extra card with the Greed, so I guess there's no counter. And I think kind of Ishan could smell the bait. He's like, if I counter the Willow, it's probably something worse coming after that, so I don't want to do that. 
Maybe a black knight, for example. Okay, there's a diamond valley. That's good. Now we just need some creatures. Rubinia Soulsinger to start stealing some stuff. Get back into this game. It's gonna tap four. Ooh, there's the Ifbiff Afrit. I always find that a risky card when you're low on life. I get it. I, I understand that you're playing it out, but can be risky. For example, Anders can now on end step just. Okay, there's the attack. I mean, this also makes sense because then you're forcing Anders to block and regenerate. What I wanted to say is that Anders could have used that green mana from the City of Brass to deal one damage. But then again, you take two damage yourself and you're killing your own Willow. So that would have been a pretty stupid move, actually. But it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen in Anders' uh, his turn. But it looks like Ishan wants to do something else. Thinking about tapping the Tropical Island there. Yeah, could have used it for green to kill the Willow, but chooses not to. I think that's a good decision. You want to keep that mana open to counter any black spells. Oh man, this is, this is a close game. If you're Anders, are you going to attack here with the Phantom offering the trade? Depends on what you have in hand, of course, but I would be tempted to do that. So Anders, understandably so, really in the tank, knows that he has to win this game. If he loses, he's out of the tournament. We're here in the semifinals of the Staples event. He had taken the trade, it seems. Oh no, it's got the bonus from the Jacques Levert, of course. Oh no! He's allowing Anders to take the backseat. I mean, these, these players know each other quite well. So it's all, it's all friendly and good, but uh, lucky there. Looks like he's going to draw another extra card, it seems, with the greed. So he still has his phantom monster. And I actually forgot about that bonus as well. Looks like he's going to play out a second phantom monster or not, taking it back. So the if if is actually a 3-5. That changes a lot, to be honest. And here we can really see that synergy between uh, Jacques Levert and Ifbif Afrit. I mean, Ifbif is, is a good card by itself, but if it's a 3-5, it gets really, really good. There's the pass, untapping. Oh, man, and now it's, I mean, it's looking bad, to be honest, for, for Anders. He's on 11, and it looks like Ishan's on 7. Gonna draw for turn here. There's another City of Brass. Doesn't change much. I wonder, like one of the things he could do is pay three, kill the phantom monster, force Anders to regenerate the willow. Actually, multiple times, which he can't, so the willow is also going to die. Then he can attack and deal six damage. I mean, it, it, it would mean he's on four. You know, Ishan would drop to four himself. But Anders would be quite low, would be on two, I believe. Okay, there's Pyrotechnics. Ooh! It's maybe even better. Yeah, he can target both of the creatures. That's exactly what he does. Then he can attack for six. And he can put Anders, I believe, on five. And the nice thing about this is that you're also making it harder for Anders to use his own greed. The greed's basically like out of the game now. He's too low. So two cards in hand for Ishan. Ooh, he is going to use... Oh, he's going to use Word of Command here. Oh, ho! 
But yeah, again, word of command's pretty bad. I mean, Anders is not hitting anything with that word of command in this match, unfortunately. That's it. Wow, 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 wow. There was a moment in this game, especially the start of game two, where I really thought that Anders was going to win it. But yeah, there's no way out for him. Also because of that if bit for Freed, of course. And that's it. Not enough life gain for Anders, I believe, uh, in the second game. And that means that Ishan is going to advance to the finals of the Staples Tournament. Congratulations, Ishan. And in that tournament, you will face Rob. And uh, Rob is playing his deck Red Ruby that we saw earlier in the quarterfinals. So that's going to be a very exciting final. Now, if you don't want to miss that final, make sure you uh, subscribe to the channel. And uh, talking about that stuff, you can also support the show, of course, by leaving a like, leaving a comment, sharing it on your socials. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. And talking about moving forward, we also have our very own Patreon page. Check out patreon.com slash timmytalks to find out how you can be a patron just like Anders and uh, Ishan. So you can find out how you can become a patron of the show. And then also if you want to join us in these tournaments and get your name in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the